All right, everybody, welcome back. I'm here with Jason Phillips. Yes, sir. Uh, we're going to have some good conversation. Now, he's a nutrition expert. And one thing I want to ask you, Jason, there's a lot of confusion that surrounds uh, things that happen to the body when you overwork it and underfeed it. Some people call it metabolic damage. Yep. Other people call it adrenal fatigue. Other people call it HPA axis dysfunction. First off, what are the symptoms of being in that state? What does it look like? And then how do you get out of that? Yeah, so, so there's metabolic adaptations, right? Which was for a long time was metabolic damage. Um, and then there's the HPA dysfunction. I like to think they're, they're separate, but they one like metabolic adaptation will lead to that HPA dysfunction. Okay. Um, and HPA dysfunction for a while was known as adrenal fatigue. Medical community came up, that shit's not a real term, <laughs> right? And yet, ironically, it's like metab or, uh, adrenal fatigue is not medically accepted, but adrenal insufficiency is, yeah, is accepted, which is super weird. <laughs> um, so I think now we're all agreeing it's HPA dysfunction. I think that'll be used um, okay. you know, as a term. But, so metabolic adaptation is basically how your body adapts to a, a certain environment, right? And for most, the way we all know that is under eating and under recovering for a very long time. So um, it's most prevalent, I would say, in the physique industry, like girls that do bikini diets or figure diets, like these old school mm -hmm fish and vegetables where they end up on like 800 calories. Mm -hmm. Basically their body adapts to that intake as the new homeostasis. So now right. why does the body do that? Why does the body adapt to these low calories and, and high exercise output? And when, what does that look like? What ends uh, up happening to these people? It's a, it's a survival mechanism, right? Like, like our bodies were not built to go to, as a female, like 8% body fat, right? Like our bodies are meant to survive, to insulate the organs, to basically to keep us functioning, right? And so if you go down to 800 calories, your body has to figure out, well, what, you know, if I use all these 800 calories by noon, well, how the hell am I gonna insulate my organs? How am I gonna keep body fat on me? How am I gonna stay warm? So your body's like, well, shit, I, I'm gonna slow down every process. I'm gonna slow down metabolism. I'm basically not going to burn anything and I'm going to have what I need to survive and to essentially thrive at some point. Unfortunately, what that looks like internally is a reduction in thyroid output, reduction in sex hormone output, an abundance of stress, right? Like, and then ultimately that's what leads to the HPA dysfunction that we're talking about, right? Now all of a sudden you don't have the ability to meet the demands of stressors. So for a while you're living um, cortisol really, really high, then all of a sudden you can't even produce any cortisol to meet the demands of stressors. That's where the lethargy comes from, which then starts to affect the sex hormone profile. So then like all of a sudden, you know, it was like for a male, you can't get hard on, right? Mm -hmm. You have no sex drive, your mood decreases, all of a sudden your sleep is complete shit. Um, and so there's there's this big interplay, but a lot of times it's starting on the metabolic Yeah, because what I'll notice a lot of times is, these, is people will come to us for coaching or for advice and, you know, I, like, I'll give you an example. I had a female who came to me 120 pounds. Yep. Uh, she was relatively lean. She'd been doing uh, about an hour of cardio every single day. Like consuming steady state or interval? Yeah, steady state. Okay. Doing, uh, and she was consuming around 1,100 calories. And anything over 1,100 calories... She gained weight. She gained weight. Yeah. And it was, she was freaking out because here she is working out all the time. She's not eating that much. And she can barely go over 1,100 calories when it, she should be able to eat a lot more. Yep. And that's what we're talking about. 100%, dude. I mean... The reality is if you went out and you did classic like formulas, right? We, we ran Harris-Benedict equation on her and we figured out her BMR. And we use that BMR um, a, you know, to, to figure out what her total daily energy expenditure is, mm -hmm. which is the foundation of nutritional prescription, right? We figured out what her daily energy expenditure is and we put her in a deficit to lose weight. I guarantee we would likely see 17, 1800 calories will sufficiently give her a, a weight loss protocol relative to all things being normal. Mm -hmm. The problem is she's Nothing's lived, normal. <laughs> yeah, she's not normal, right? So she's lived in this world of excessive exercise and we know aerobic exercise in and of itself is also very intensive or is, is actually going to affect the adrenals, right? And we have research on that. So like adrenal insufficiency is going to happen. Look at like a lot of marathoners. Mm. All of their adrenals are fucked, oh, right? Yeah, like their HPAs are fucked. So all of a sudden she's doing a lot of aerobic exercise as her cardio, right? She's doing steady state cardio. She's under eating, therefore she's under recovering. So she can no longer meet the, meet the demands of stress. Her body's adapted to that. She, her body's figured out how do I survive at 1100 calories? Well, that's it. The problem is that survival has also come with caloric output. So if she stopped the cardio, and she stays at 1,100 calories, she still might gain weight. Because really, her body's probably thinking it's functioning somewhere around 800 calories because wow. of that, that 300 calorie burn that she's getting from that hour wow. of cardio. Now, now, how do you start to back out of something like that? You Carefully. Got, <laughs> <laughs> so you have someone coming to you, uh, 
their body's not responding anymore. They're noticing all the symptoms you're talking about, low energy. They need lots of coffee throughout the day. They, yeah. Their sleep patterns are all off. Um, they're not able to lose weight anymore. It's like their body plateaued really hard, even though they're eating very, very little. What are some of the first steps that you think that they should take to kind of come out of that? So the first thing, so ultimately what has to happen is you have to have less stress on the body, right? Like that's the fundamental of, of everything I'm about to give you. So one, that can come with a reduction in exercise or it can come with a caloric increase or a combination of both. Okay. So typically like classical reverse diet protocol is going to be take your current intake, add 20% of calories, right? So you said she's on about 1100. Let's say you're going to add 220 calories. Mm -hmm. That brings her to 1320. And maybe you'll reduce the cardio from an hour to 40 minutes or sure. 30 minutes, right? You can't just go balls to the wall and be like, all right, great. Like you cardio sucks. Like, just, just don't do any cardio, you know, don't really lift. And by the way, eat 3000 calories or she's going to rebound really hard mm -hmm. and potentially that rebound in and of itself can further exacerbate all the issues she's seeing fascinating um so what you're gonna do is you're gonna do it slowly now here's the problem with doing it slowly there's three like we just talked about on the podcast yeah. right like there's three scenarios that can happen one if she hasn't been adapted super long she might hyper respond and her body might be like hey this is exactly what i was looking for i was looking for more fuel this is actually what i need to reignite the thermogenic process in my body right the fat burning process in my body so I'm going to actually start burning fat as fuel. Then you can further reduce, you know, reduce cardio, add calories over time. And, and you're actually going to see. And that's the dream scenario. That's a dream scenario. We right. call those hyper responders, okay. right? Um, then you're going to see the scenario where you're adding calories, um, decreasing cardio. Nothing's going to change really physically, but you're going to get a lot of physiological shift. So she's going to produce a hunger response all of a sudden. She's going to start sleeping better. Her mood's going to be better. Her sex drive is going to get higher. Um, all of these things are going to increase. Her, her body composition might even get a little bit better, right? Because her nutrient partitioning might get a little bit better. Um, but she's not really going to change a lot of body weight. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a terrible scenario. Most people can get on board with that. The shit scenario is her metabolism is really in a bad place. Her hormone output's really in a terrible place. And she actually starts to gain weight over time. Um, Which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's right? not terrible, right? Because if you think about it, what does her body really need for survival? It needs a little bit more right. weight. Like it, it thinks that it, you know... It's going back to homeostasis because what's going to happen at some point where there's extra weight, mm -hmm. her, her natural inclination for neat, right, is going to increase because her body's going to finally perceive, oh, I'm overweight, mm -hmm. so I need to be doing more activity. Oh, good so point. her propensity to go out and, and to walk places is going to increase. Like, she, it sounds really stupid, but like shit like tapping her foot, like things like that will start increasing more because her propensity for neat will increase. That's actually been done. They've actually done studies on that. We'll yeah. find people who have fast metabolism actually just fidget throughout the entire yeah. day. They just move more. All that shit that like we thought was meaningless, it's it's non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Like mm -hmm. that shit's important. Mm -hmm. um, so it will increase her propensity for that. Um, and then once you restore caloric maintenance, you know, you've kind of restored thyroid output, you've restored all the hormonal uh, balance in her body. Now you're in a position where you can actively pursue fat loss. So now you can create a reasonable calorie deficit um, you know, not a, like 1,100 calories, yeah. but a reasonable number with the appropriate amounts of cardio, the appropriate amounts of intensity. And uh, that can take a while sometimes. Dude, it can take a, it can take over a year. It I takes, mean, I, I've, I've personally worked with cases where it's taken a year and 10 months. Wow, um, almost two years. So you know what no one's talking about though? And we didn't talk about this on the podcast. Sure. I think there's a resulting nervous system adaptation that happens with metabolic well, adaptations. I mean, of course it has to, right? The so, nervous system adapts to everything. Now. It adapts to everything, but I think it, it remembers. So a lot of these people that got into this place, they do they do really high intensity work. Let's talk CrossFitters, mm -hmm. right? So out of the physique world. They go to this place, low calorie and CrossFit. Their body remembers, well, what took me to this really fucked up place? Mm -hmm. A calorie deficit and, and, and really high intensity, high intensity work. So what happens even after restoring hormonal function, even after restoring thyroid function, when you take them back to that place and you give them really high intensity activity, the body's scared to go back. So scared. Yeah. So you'll actually see somebody that is one time a very high level athlete. You put them back in that scenario, they're never able to produce that same level of output. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If you've been in this state of, you know, HP axis dysfunction or you know, metabolic damage or whatever for, let's say, four years, which, by the way, and depending on the context, is not that out of the ordinary. Nope. If you're one of these athletes that pushes your body really hard, you also that also comes with this crazy willpower, right? Yes. So you see these hard-headed athletes that just keep at it. And if your body's in the state for four or five years, and then you try to come out of it and you give yourself a year, well, your body's remembering the previous five. 100%.
the previous five. A hundred percent. That's now. Do you see? Is this common in the CrossFit world? <laughs> it's massively common wow. in CrossFit, and I would actually argue you see some. And, and I can think of one person. I won't say a name, but he went to the CrossFit Games. The next year, he straw like. So the way it works in CrossFit is open regional CrossFit. He yes. went to the games. The next year he went back to regionals. He didn't even get top 20 because, because he this. was so overworked. His wow. body just couldn't produce the level of output necessary. It wasn't because he couldn't do the moves. His body just wouldn't go to that like dark place that you hear CrossFitters talk about, right? Like that red line area because it just, it knows that it's going to be hurting itself. Again, what do we talk about with adaptation, right? It's, it's created this adaptation to not hurt itself, to create a survival mechanism, not a performance mechanism. And the, and the body will always win. The body's always going to win. You're, like, you're you can't outsmart it. it like that. Like it's just, you would have to time somebody with nervous system adaptation so perfectly because you might get a couple good workouts out of them. You'd have to time it so perfectly that it would it'd be very difficult. To you predict. just have to listen to it. And you know, one of the problems with this is that we're taught, um, and this happens a lot in the CrossFit world, but it happens in other athletic endeavors as well. We're taught to push ourselves to continue to hammer ourselves that that is what makes somebody who's average become a champion and so it's hard to listen to these signals because these signals may just be like well i'm just tired but i got to push myself because that's what i've been taught Let's, yeah that's what are some early what are some early signal signs that people can pay attention to that'll help tell them okay you need to back off a little bit or you need to eat a little bit more like what are the early signs before yeah. we get into that bad stage so, so it's kind of counterintuitive. So the first thing is a loss in hunger. So if you if you take somebody that's been hungry very frequently and all of a sudden their appetite dissipates, that's they're a great over, one. They're overstressed, guys. Everybody should operate with a small amount of hunger. It's a it's a sign that your metabolism is actually functioning. That's a great one. Um, the second would be sleep. Is the inability to fall asleep and stay asleep. So remember how cortisol works, right? A normal functioning individual, you should wake up. Cortisol should be elevated. It should taper off throughout the day. In somebody that's bordering towards HPA dysfunction, what you're starting to see is they wake up, cortisol's low, and, it comes and it's throughout increasing throughout the day. It's a reverse curve. Reverse curve. So what, they're what we call tired and wired at night. They get in bed, they're tired, but all of a sudden their mind is thinking about virtually anything but sleep. Wow. Right? They're thinking about the stress of their day, what they're going to do tomorrow. They can't fall asleep. Those are the two major ones. I know there's thousands of people right now that can relate to this. I've had yes. so many clients who, you know, they'll go to, they'll tell me like, I fall asleep fine, yep. but for whatever reason, at 2 a.m. every night, I wake up wide awake and I can't get back to sleep. And then when they finally fall back to sleep at 4 and the alarm goes off at 5.30, they're dead tired. They're dead. Dead and they're tired. like, well, oh, it's because I woke up. No, it's because you have no cortisol. Wow. So, so you have uh, loss of appetite, yep. poor sleeping patterns, whether that be can't fall asleep or can't stay asleep. Are yep. there any others? How, Absolutely. Okay. So like mood disturbances, right? If you notice yourself as a typically happy person or if you just find yourself like going off the deep end for, for no reason, that can be a function. Sex drive. Um, low you sex know, no drive. one, no one wants to talk about it, but it's very real. Like mm -hmm. low sex drive. Um, let's see another one. What um, about inability to adjust to temperature changes? Yeah. Like, so getting really cold okay. all the time. So getting cold is is directly um, related to thyroid, right? So okay. when your thyroid mm -hmm. levels are low, you're going to be cold all the time. Um, the other one would be just like desire to train and recovery from training. Uh, so your body's not. You first of all, you lose your your, Lose your desire to normal train. motivation to yep. work out feels like you're you're having to push yourself and then uh just to just you just feel crap yeah you just like i mean you're more sore more frequently uh you know you leave the gym and like you know later that day you're just so tired but um the really it's that motivation piece to train because like you know we all have bad days mm -hmm. we all have stressful days we learn to push through them but if that's happening almost every day that's an issue now how important is identifying this to somebody's to for somebody to get to their goals because I know a lot of people watching right now are it's the think, fundamental of well everything. and I know a lot of people watching right now are thinking like okay that sounds great but I just want to get ripped I just want to build muscle I just want to look good and they don't connect the two they don't think that taking the rest when they need it or feeding themselves more when they need it by identifying some of these signals is going to actually help them get ripped faster or get build muscle faster actually get there faster maybe we can talk about that for a second well so so let's just kind of take a step back and look at it the people that are going to get the leanest the fastest and the most jacked the fastest are the people with the the best thyroid output and the people with the best hormone profile right so if you think about it if you're blunting those things by overstressing your body by doing all the things we just talked about right by training too much by doing too much too much aerobic work by um you know, by not recovering, not eating enough, not sleeping, it, you're reducing thyroid output, you're reducing sex hormone output. 
So you're actually inhibiting your body's ability to do what you just said you want to do, which is get ripped and get muscular, mm -hmm. right? So you have to pay attention. You have to leave your body functioning at a high level, right? And there's going to be some uh, decline over a dieting process. Like it, it's, it has to happen, right? Sure. Over the course, like when you get super lean, your hormone level is not going to be what it is it's, when you're 10% body especially fat. Especially when you start to get to single digit body yes. fat percentages. So, but it should be a normal decline. It should be a natural decline. It shouldn't be something that was forced. And when you start forcing your body to go to those places, it's going to instinctively, instinctively go back to its survival mechanism. Mm. And its survival mechanism is hold on to body fat. Insulate the, insulate the organs, remain healthy. Wow, because the number one goal of the body is to stay alive. Stay alive. So in other words, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, sometimes to build more muscle and to burn more body fat, you need to work out less and eat more. Uh, I would say, I'll go on record and say 80% of people watching this right now need to eat more and train less. Wow, you heard it here first. Uh, check it out, share this with your friends. I know you know people who are doing way too much and eating way too little, this video could literally save their lives. Make sure you share it with them and also subscribe to our channel. We post videos all the time.